Yeah, it used to be laryngitis was like, huh, that's funny. I sound like a frog nowadays. It's like, oh, no, I can't do my job. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a 1,000 tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and L.A. bid on Ruby developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average Ruby developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary offer of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Ruby Rogues link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hire to get a $1,337 bonus if they accept the job. Go sign up at Hire.com slash Ruby Rogues. Snap is a hosted CI and continuous delivery that is simple and intuitive. Snap's deployment pipelines deliver fast feedback and can push healthy builds to multiple environments automatically or on demand. Snap integrates deeply with GitHub and has great support for different languages, data stores, and testing frameworks. Snap deploys your application to cloud services like Heroku, DigitalOcean, AWS, and many more. Try Snap for free. Sign up at snapci.com slash rubyrogues. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the provider I use to host all of my creations. All the shows are hosted there, along with any other projects I come up with. Their user interface is simple and easy to use, their support is excellent, and their VPSs are backed on salt state drives and are fast and responsive. Check them out at DigitalOcean.com. If you use the code RubyRogues, you'll get a $10 credit. Welcome to the Ruby Rogues podcast, episode number 226. I'm your host, Saran, and with me today, I have Avdi Grimm. Hello from Tennessee. Jessica Kerr. Good morning. And today's guest is Loren Basavi. Laurent, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, hi Abdi, hi Jessica, hi Saran. I'm Laurent, I'm a developer with um, 20 plus years of experience. It doesn't actually show in my hair yet. Uh, and I'm currently working for uh, the French government, of all things, on uh, funny things we call state startups. Um, that's basically our bid to try and get the government to work in a more uh, agile way, except we're no longer calling it agile. Anyway, that's me. Wait, why are you no longer calling it Agile? I want to hear oh, that. Oh, that's uh, passe. Uh, <laughs> we're cool with that. It, it doesn't really matter what we call it. As long as we do the right things, deliver frequently stuff that works, makes customers happy. And that, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's still uh, a huge cultural shock. <laughs> Is the happiness shocking? Oh, yes. I mean, you know what it's like. Maybe you don't. You don't know what it's like working in a government. But uh, government and happiness, those two words don't usually go hand in hand. Well, I'm, I'm just kidding here, but <laughs> that's okay. We understand. <laughs> so, one of the things that we wanted to talk to you about was a book that you wrote called "The Leprechauns of Software Engineering." You want to tell us a little bit about that? Where to start? <laughs> So I guess the, the first thing is to explain the title. And so someone once remarked to me that straightforward titles work better than cryptic ones, but I, I didn't know that at the time, and I, you know, I kind of get stuck with the, that title. Uh, so uh, Leprechaun was the name I came up with to uh, call things that, quote-unquote, uh, everyone knows in the software profession specifically, but I think the, the concept of a Leprechaun can be... Uh, uh, reused uh, fruitfully in, in other domains. But I was very much focused on the software domain. So uh, a leprechaun is something that everybody uh, has heard about, that everybody knows is a, a kind of a, a well-known fact, but except that it turns out not to be true uh, when you get closer to it. Uh, and I, I came up with the name uh, leprechauns because some of the uh, objections that people came up with, uh, you know, some of the uh, critiques I got were along the lines of, but can you prove that uh, this thing you were talking about doesn't make sense or doesn't exist? And I was you know, kind of taken aback with that and I, uh, until I started reasoning that it's, this is kind of like trying to get me to prove that leprechauns do not exist. Yes, that's not possible. So uh, I, I can convince people that leprechauns do not exist. Uh, what I was trying to do in the book was to show the homework that I've done in trying to uh, locate the sources of some of these well-known facts, uh, noting the times when I came up empty. Can you give an example of some of those facts? 
Uh, the first one that I started with was, was the uh, 10x programmer uh, meme. So, you know, this notion that the best programmers uh, uh, outperform in terms of productivity, the average programmers by a factor of 10 at least. And people, uh, if you look around, people are, are uh, fond of quoting that. It seems that lately there's more, more of a you know, kind of a backlash, uh, people starting to profess doubts about this one. And maybe that's uh, down to me having done my job. I don't know. This, yeah, I, always uh, ex- I always kind of accepted that one, you know, or at least for a while. I, you know, I read it, and I think like everyone else, and I thought, oh, yeah, okay, that, you know, you, you sort of match it up with like your experience of like this, you know, one programmer that was really bad and these other programmers that were super good, and, and you don't think about it. Right, but right. He, uh, the point about yeah. where it was 10 times greater than average is significant because I've definitely seen some one-tenth programmers. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the that's the thing. When people quote that, it's, it's kind of like the, the business with the quotes by uh, Einstein that Einstein never actually said. Uh, I think my, my favorite one is uh, uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I love that uh, one. Yeah, but that's not the definition of insanity. It's the, the definition of <laughs> experimentation, right? Darn. And Einstein never so. said anyway. So, you know, it's it's something that people keep saying, but they misquote it. So the original research when I went uh, looking into that uh, was never about comparing average developers with the top developers. It was comparing the worst with the best. And that's, I guess you would agree, I hope you would agree, a different proposition. Right. Yeah, there's a big difference between comparing the worst to the best and comparing the average to the best. Because if people go looking for that 10x programmer, they're just going to find somebody who thinks they're a 10x programmer. Especially if they're comparing themselves to uh, you know, people who really are not good at programming. So actually, that makes the factor infinite in principle. You can always, given any programmer, uh, you can probably find someone, if you can look anywhere, uh, who's at least 10 times less competent than they are. Yeah, so that makes people think that the whole 10x myth makes sense because they can line it up with something they've experienced. Yep. But there's a big difference between that anecdote of one person is 10 times better than another one, and there's a whole class of programmers who are 10 times better than all programmers on average. And that's kind of the dream that uh, this notion that there, uh, you know, somewhere there is a, a 10x programmer land where you can go to and uh, basically find people who will save your project or save your startup or whatever. So I guess one of the things I found, not specifically when I, when I was in investigating that meme, uh, because that was only the start, uh, right? Uh, as I was looking into more and more of these things, it struck me that people believe things, I guess primarily because they wanted to believe. They, they wanted that to be true. It's It's kind of a comfort to think that you don't have to invest in actually training people, developing competence. You can just go to 10x programmer land and, and, you know, catch one of those rare beasts. That's interesting. I never thought of it that way. I didn't think of the idea of a 10x programmer, meaning that you don't have to invest in training someone. You just need to find someone who magically has these skills. I mean, and here again, there is the difference between uh, what the research that people sometimes quote says and what you can read between the lines of people trotting out that claim in, in discourse about how we should manage programming projects. So, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to really look in, into the, uh, the actual sources. I wanted not to be fooled uh, about whether there was actually any research on that, what the research actually said, what the limitations of that research were. So, for instance, you have to know that uh, most of the research was actually done in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, something like that. Uh, And practically everything that people uh, cite as confirmatory research of those early studies were, in fact, indirect citations of the original studies. So it's like you have one researcher coming out with a paper saying, uh, we were investigating something else. And uh, oh, by the way, we found out that there, there was a 20x, actually, that the original uh, research said, factor of difference between the, the best and the worst in that group. 
And someone else wrote a paper saying, oh, there's this uh, interesting research result that says there's a, an order of magnitude difference between the best and, and the worst programmers. Uh, and then like a third person piled onto that saying, uh, there are at least already two results saying that there's a, an order of magnitude difference between programmers. And by, by the time you get to the uh, fourth or fifth paper in the chain, it's like everybody knows. I mean, that there's tons of research saying that uh, there's this order of magnitude difference, uh, except it's all pointing back indirectly to the same primary source. I feel like I've heard somebody call that cytogenesis or something like that, um, you know, where a, a fact is basically manufactured by multiple citations. Right. A few years out of thin air. <laughs> yeah, and, and we had that, that same problem. When I used to work at NPR, we had that. That was a problem that we looked out for, too, because in journalism, we call it the echo chamber. You know, you have this one story with this one source. It gets picked up by one other publication. Another publication picks it up from that publication. All of a sudden, it's like, yeah, this really big thing thing is happening when really it was just this one t tiny source that everyone's just piggybacking off of. So it goes viral. It's like a cat yeah. picture. <laughs> and, and the shocking thing is that it's, it's, it's viral even in professional papers, scientific papers. Yes. You know, not just like Facebook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Uh, as I put it, it crosses the layman uh, researcher barrier. Hmm. Right. And it, one of the things that I was shocked by as I was reading your book is realizing that some of the things you address, I can't remember if it was the 10X programmer, but some of the other things like the defect curve, I'm not sure if that's the right term, but they were things that I sort of, you know, I took as gospel because I read them in books like Code Complete, which, you know, is famously one of the better researched books on software development. Yes, that's one of uh, one of my uh, favorite books as well, which put me in a kind of uh, awkward position when I got into uh, kind of a fairly intense row with uh, Steve McConnell over the, the, the 10x thing. So uh, <laughs> I think when when we hear the word uh, research, we, we may make different assumptions as to the level of uh, rigor involved. And, and so there's the level scrut scrutiny that a claim deserves if you're in you know actual structured academia. Uh, but most of the sources that we have as, as working programmers are, you know, people who... Uh, yeah, that, that, that's going to sound harsh, but I mean it also for myself. Uh, people who are propagandists rather than actual scientists, we don't have the same expectations applied against us. We, we are trying to convince rather than to find truth or you know, unshakable evidence of something. That's very true. I mean, as a conference speaker, when I talk about some ideas or some experience I have, it's completely anecdotal. And I'm like, you should do it this way. You should use immutable values because it makes life easier. And what I really mean is my life and my particular experiences. And I just want people to take what's useful to them. But you're right. As soon as anyone with even the appearance of authority says something, that can start the cytogenesis. Yeah, I think problem too, I mean, you, you mentioned the cost of defects curve. So that was probably the, the second thing that I started investigating. And I, I was in a really different position on that one. I mean, the, the 10x thing sort of always rubbed me the wrong way because it, it sort of assumed that people had this innate capacity to be a, a, a good developer. And I thought that was very much a crazy thing to propagate that, that we should invest in, in uh, developing people and training people and, and uh, developing more skills than just the technical ones. So, so I was kind of biased against that claim initially, which means I was probably looking harder for uh, um, uh, evidence against it than I was looking for evidence for it. But the, uh, the, the cost of defects curve was a, an interesting case in that sense, because I was uh, actually one of the probably one of the people firmly convinced that this thing was true that the what, what is so, the so the, the, the the claim is well there, there are uh, again different uh interpretations because it's it's uh suffered this uh telephone game thing where uh, as you as you go farther from the source it becomes more and more distorted so the the way i would have phrased it a few years ago was uh everybody knows that uh, the cost of fixing a bug grows exponentially with time. So the, the longer a bug has been around in your code, the more expensive it's going to get to fix it. And I was 
using that as a justification for practices like test-driven development or uh, pair programming. Catch bugs at the source before they become big problems. Uh, I even found myself uh, at one point uh, getting into an online argument on a forum with, you know, it's the uh, someone is wrong on the internet uh, phenomenon. I was uh, arguing my, my side by saying it's, it's very well known. It's, it's uh, in fact probably one of the uh, few well accepted facts in software engineering that bugs cost more to fix the longer they stick around. And it's funny because uh, after I wrote the book, I went back to that forum and uh, apologized in public to the uh, person I was arguing with at the time saying, oops, <laughs> I'm sorry, I was wrong, you were right. And that, that was a measure to, to me of degree of effort that it takes to actually change your mind. So when you're looking at these different leprechauns, is that the common theme? Is it that just this one little fact got blown out of proportion and went viral and was taken out of context? Is that what they all have in common? Uh, and and gets distorted in various ways, and and also that people tend to use them as a you know, as a bludgeon, as a as a way of hitting people over the head to get them to believe in something. And I think that you know the solution to that is actually pretty simple. It's to say, rather than base your claims on uh, authority, you can just say, I found that this or that thing works for me, and it's interesting to inquire about. Why? Why does it work for me? Uh, and, and there may be a reason why it might not work for you, and that would be also interesting if that happened. So I found that I, I didn't actually have to, to have the authority of decades of research behind me as I was arguing for things. So now you speak from the authority of your own experience? That and trying to, uh, I mean... Probably not everything in, in uh, software engineering has to be uh, uh, anecdotal. We, we can probably do useful research and find out things which are reliably true under uh, various conditions. But it also requires, in doing that, doing that sort of looking for what I would call local truths, it requires a frame of mind where you're not simultaneously uh, depending on those truths, those arguments, those claims to, to convince other people. Can you say more about that local truths? Well, w one of the problems with things like uh, the, the cost of defects curve or uh, anything to do with defects in general. Uh, so if you, if you come across an article saying, on average, it costs this amount of uh, dollars or uh, man hours to, to fix a defect. That's very likely to be a leprechaun because every project is different. So uh, th there's going to be a huge range of variation, you know, between projects. So in, in, in this case, it's going to cost maybe, I don't know, t 10 bucks uh, to fix a typical defect, if, if you can even say that there is such a thing locally in a project. And in a different context, maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, aerospace or uh, embedded medical devices, then here it's going to be much more expensive. So it doesn't even make sense to uh, formulate statements as if they could apply to all projects everywhere, whatever the domain may be. That's a, uh, right there is a good sign of a leprechaun, something which is too universal sounding. But you could look at your own project and say, in general, when we create a bug, what tend to be the causes? And you could say, maybe half of the time, it's because we have miscommunicated something in, in uh, dialogue with the customer or users. And the other half of the time, it's because we're working with, uh, I don't know, maybe it's because we're using Java and Java is a crap language, something like that. I'm not suggesting that Java is a bad language. But it could be <laughs> bad for a particular project or for right. a particular group of developers. But I mean, that, that would be useful insight if you could uncover it, that there, there is some kind of a mismatch between the uh, competencies of a group and the language they are using, and then you can you could you could come to a useful decision, which would be to I don't know maybe switch to Ruby or something, uh, or I don't know maybe Cobol. <laughs> Pro probably not Cobol. It's interesting how attached to these things we get. I mean, I try to think about like why I know I've had these arguments before. You know, I know I've had these arguments about like you should do this, and here's the research that says that you should, and somebody's wrong on the internet, and I can't rest until. 
I prove it to them. And I, it's strange, like introspecting on that and trying to figure out what, where that urge comes from. And I really think it comes from fear, you know, pain that I've experienced in the past, fear that somebody is out there is, go, is inflicting or is, is working on inflicting that pain on somebody else, you know, by their ignorance. Maybe. There's also the, there's the, there's when you do experience something like some, those, like those really painful bugs in production and you want to save other people from that. I love that Lauren called that lo a local truth because it is, it's very true in your experience. And yet some, something completely different could be very true in someone else's experiences. And when you can't like scope that, when something has been universally true for you, it's really hard to recognize that that might not be universally true for someone else. And I think to, to pick up on the on the fear aspect, there there is a an emotional uh, angle to that whole uh, thing. We have a very well developed capacity to fool ourselves, basically. So and and that shows up in programming, I think probably more uh, um, frequently than in other professions. We think that something is simple, and we code it as if it were simple, and we conveniently forget the things we know about that thing not being so simple, uh, and so we can you know just uh, rest on our laurels and, until the thing gets to production. And of, of, of course, the longer the cycles, uh, the, the farther that reckoning is put off, right? Which is why I think as a rule, you know, one of the things I am in fact convinced of is that type short feedback cycles are actually uh, a big deal in programming. It's uh, yeah, I have this opinion. I, I could be disabused of it, but it would take some work. But anyway, we, we are good at this, you know, fooling ourselves thing. So when we are confronted with uh, evidence that we were not, in fact, correct in assuming, uh, I don't know, that a username is always a first name and a last name. Maybe you've had that kind of wake up call. Like someone tries to input a one component name and they're not able to even use your app because their name is just something not something, something, but just okay. something, right? I have a friend whose name is three, just oh. three. So oh, wow. his very existence defies probably uh, the assumption of probably 99% of programmers out there. Yeah. And worst case, he can't even use your app and you never learn that because he can't use it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Right. So it takes, I think it actually takes active uh, effort to go seeking for uh, things which will invalidate your operating assumptions. And when you, when you do find it, it's usually something which it's not a, it's not a good feeling. It's, uh, you know, someone, someone tells you, Oh, you're wrong. Most likely you're going to take it kind of a, as a, as a personal attack. Right. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to put yourself in the frame of mind where, where when someone tells you, you're wrong about that. You jump for joy and say, oh, great. I'm so happy you told me I'm wrong. Because that's an opportunity for learning. Exactly. You mentioned the, the feedback cycles. I think you have a, a really interesting point about how the longer the cycle from development to production is the longer we get to keep our illusions about the simplicity <laughs> of what we just coded. And yet, yeah, totally, I agree that the short cycles are super important for learning. Because if it's been more than two weeks since you coded the thing, uh, you don't remember that experience. How are you going to learn anything from the new piece of information? Right. Which, which, by the way, is one excellent argument for why having bugs stick around longer makes them more expensive to fix. But you have to scope that argument properly. It's not, it's not going to affect all bugs. Uh, so something which, which is a, you know, a key uh, architectural assumption buried somewhere deep in your code or even worse copied and pasted in in 20 places uh and then you wait six months for that to, to come to light yeah that that's going to be a big problem one thing we can do is make it cheaper to fix bugs that do make it to production because those those shorter development cycles when we make it cheap to make changes in production we've drastically lowered those costs and that's a win no matter what mm-hmm and 
When you start down that path, I think there are, there are lots of things that uh, come up which are useful. Like uh, if if you if you try and make yourself consciously aware that you are making all sorts of assumptions about how your uh, users are going to respond to the app, and and you go out and look for ways to invalidate those assumptions, you know, rather than close your eyes and, and, and say everything is going to be okay because I have a pretty good idea of who the users are, that, that's probably going to change things a lot. So you're going to uh, look for ways to, uh, uh, for instance, monitor production usage. Uh, you're, you're going to troll your production logs for any kind of insight that it provides. And, and you're going to take a, a very different attitude to developing the product. So rather than having, you know, the usual build it and throw it over the wall to uh, operations, maybe that that's one of the things that cause you to take more of an interest in, say, things like DevOps. Yeah. I, I'd like to, to hear a little bit more about um, some of the other leprechauns you discovered. I think I think the 10x and the, the defect curve are some of the biggies. But are there any other claims that you've found that just don't hold up? Again, a bunch of things about the economics of uh, software defects, but the, what we think we know about the, the drivers of uh, uh, project success. The, the one that figuring out that the, the, the cost of defects was a very limited data set and uh, that the claim made only a very limited sort of sense was kind of one of the most liberating moments. And then there, there are others that I went after f- more for uh, fun that I, I kind of uh, sussed out from the start that they, they were bogus, but it was more the, the, f- the fun of the chase, figuring out where the, the, the original claim could have come from. And s- w- one of the funniest one is the thing about 70% of the, the Department of Defense projects having ended it in, in project failure. Uh, and then uh, this thing has been picked up by a few of the uh, Agile gurus as a way of arguing that Agile works better than Waterfall. And so this is one of the, the you know, one of those claims that people have uh, repeated left and right because based on borrowed authority, they, they felt like it, it betrayed the arguments about Agile. Uh, and when I looked into it, it turned out that the actual source of the claim was one study in the 70s of a, a group of seven projects that were uh, examined by the uh, uh, Government Accounting Office of the U.S. because they were in trouble. Uh, mm-hmm. So that, that was a, a biased set right from the start. And then somebody sort of mixed up that study uh, again, in, in the 70s, on a very small, very limited set of projects for, uh, I think the total budget was $7 million. But they mixed it up with another slide in the same conference presentation, which showed the overall size of the defense budget on uh, on IT, which was um, $35.7 billion. And they, in a sort of mashed up the two slides uh, and came out with this notion that a study of waterfall projects in '95 had shown that 70% of that 35.7 billion had been spent on uh, fake projects. So uh, it's a great meme. It's even a mashup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ones with was, the uh, pictures that, have a more accurate impression yeah. of their real authority. <laughs> and, and you have to remember that this was back in the 2000s, like, you know, the, way before the Internet gave us this wonderful set of tools to spread memes. <laughs> and, and that's one example of what people call this, the software crisis, right? <laughs> well, that turns out to be another one. <laughs> the notion of a crisis was, again, uh, kind of the same kind of deal. Well, editorial sleight of hand in, in, in this case, the original uh, conference that christened the software engineering movement was held in 1968. Uh, and it convened a group, of, a group of people to talk about various problems in, in software. But pretty much nobody in that set was intent on holding any particular set of pathologies a software crisis in those exact terms. 
they spoke about a, a crisis more vaguely once or two times in the conference proceedings. But it turned out that the person who edited the proceedings uh, and then later made sure that they, they were uh, popularized among, uh, among uh, software engineering academia made a point to say that the conference was convened in response to software crisis and, and that software engineering was the, the response of the community to that software crisis. And then, you know, a couple uh, decades on, when you look at histories of software engineering, everyone was repeating that claim that the NATO conference in uh, 1968 uh, was mounted as a response to the looming software crisis. People like a good story. I like a good story. I mean, I'm not throwing stones here. But after a while, uh, you have to think, have we really been living in a crisis for over 40 years now? Is that even possible? Ooh, ooh, ooh. We were talking earlier about how these claims, they get cited in a whole bunch of places. And there's a logical fallacy. I'm sorry, a, a cognitive bias. Yes, yes. A cognitive bias that's discussed in Thinking Fast and Slow about how if we hear news of something multiple times, it gets stored in our head as multiple incidents. So like if you see on the news like eight different times within a week about a particular kidnapping, you'll get it into your head, not consciously, but subconsciously, that eight kidnappings occurred. And so you like drastically overestimate the number of kidnappings that are happening. We're really doing oh, wow. small wow. statistics. Yes, yeah, so it was exactly so interesting. Like, yeah, yeah. And it works with this too, because if you hear from six different papers that 70% of waterfall projects fail, but really they're all citing the same one, which may or may not be accurate, then you feel like there were 10 sources. Yep. Oh, although uh, I have to uh, interject a memo to the audience here, which is go and fact check what was just said. Uh, <laughs> yes, read thinking uh, fast nice. and slow. <laughs> right. So check the source, go see, go look for that particular study. Even if the, the exact details are not right, there's a whole bunch of literature which shows, and, and thinking fast and slow is a great introduction to that whole uh, topic, that we are uh, subjects to what I call uh, bugs in the brain. That's my pet name for cognitive biases. Which is, I think that's, you know, cognitive bias is more academic sounding. Uh, it's kind of nice to think of them as uh, bugs because then we can invoke, uh, you know, the well-known to programmers anyway, uh, <laughs> duality of bugs and features, right? You know, some of the things that we think are bugs come to be experienced by users as uh, features and, and vice versa, right? Uh, so in that, in that case, it's the way the brain evolved over uh, evolutionary time. We were equipped with things which worked well in, in one specific context, which was basically the, the savanna, but which turned out not to be so helpful in the, the modern world. And evolution hasn't caught up with the modern world yet. Uh, and so we have kind of this disconnect between how we know we ought to think and we tend to think that we think the way we ought to think, if that makes any sense. But in fact, we think in more mistaken ways most of the time. And those bugs in the brain, those are really expensive to fix. <laughs> right, because we don't, we don't really have access to the source code. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I feel like programmers are particularly prone to estimating that, that they have determined something rationally, that they've d determined something, um, you know, empirically, when in fact they haven't, but not even seeing that it was a biased process. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, I think you just said the word estimate. Yeah. Uh, esti estimations is one of those, you know, kind of hot button topics uh, where... I've kind of stayed on, on the sidelines of the whole uh, no estimates debate, I guess mostly because few of the people participating in that are actually trying to pull the uh, studies show or uh, research shows card. So as, as, as long as that's the case, uh, I don't intervene. But there, there's actually uh, some very interesting research about how, not estimation specifically, but uh, the, the topic of calibration. Uh, when you say, I am... 50% sure that something is going to be the case. For instance, say your 
you know, like every, everybody, you've been paying attention to the uh, yeah. predictions about uh, yeah. an event of a certain phone manufacturer that, that's going to take place tomorrow. And you may be convinced by what's, what's been said about the name of the product or the features of the product. And you say, well, I'm 90% sure that they're, they're not going to announce a new uh, uh, iPad tomorrow. Whoops, I said the name. <laughs> uh, and, and a good question to ask when you come up with that sort of judgment is uh, if I say 90% sure, uh, then nine times out of 10, when I, when I make a claim that that's at that level of confidence, I should be correct. And I should be incorrect one time out of 10. This is in how to measure anything, right? Yes. Yes. I was going to pick Among that others. today. I'll definitely pick it today. Cool. Another book which I really liked about that topic is uh, the one by uh, Philip Tetlock. So there's one called uh, Expert Political Judgment. So it's nothing to do with software. He studied experts in the field of uh, international policy. And, and he found that the, the same findings that applies to uh, lay people, which is that we are extremely poorly calibrated, uh, also applies to uh, so-called experts, people who are actually paid to have opinions. So no, no one is immune. And the effect is that when you say 90% confidence that something is true or is going to happen, it turns out that the, the actual number of times that this is going to be correct out of 10 is typically closer to uh, six if you're good. Uh, and for most people, it's closer to four. So an expressed level of confidence of 90%, when you, when you investigate that, and I, I had a workshop at one time which was called The, uh, the Art of Being Wrong. So it was, uh, I, I, I toured conferences with that workshop uh, until I grew bored with it, basically. And you give people a list of 10 uh, questions and you ask them, how confident are you that your answer to that question is correct? And so there, there are sort of trivia style questions so that you can actually check the answers afterwards. And it turns out that when people tell you they're 90% sure of something, most of the time, four, uh, they get four answers correct out of 10. So yeah, it's, uh, the, the exercise is very repeatable. Steve McConnell has a, a, a book about uh, software, software estimation, demystifying the black art, uh, which includes that exercise. And I, I think it's a very good a uh, starter to have that kind of conversation. It's a very good way of revealing a local truth, to use that term again, to a group of people. Say, we're going to take a, a group of 10 people is more than enough to have some confidence in the results. And we are going to run a small experiment today. Uh, so we're not going to read about a study. We're going to perform an experiment. And we're going to show you to put you face to face with the truth of what it means when you say I'm 90 confident, 90% 90 confident of something. And then you show them what usually happens is you show them that it's, it's closer to 40% actual uh, degree of accuracy. You know, and that, that makes you feel on a more emotional level w what's going on and what, what a cognitive bias feels like. So that point that Avdi brought up a little while ago about the tendency for us to think that our conclusions are very logical and that they're, they're fact-based. Do you think that that's something specific to the tech industry? Is it a, something about being a programmer that makes that more likely to happen, or is it just a, a human thing? If you if you go by uh, Tetlock's book, I see no reason not to go by it. It affects all domains of expertise. So there is one uh, kind of situation where you can expect people's uh, assessments to be fairly accurate. And it is when you are close to the very core of their domain of expertise. And so for most people, that is a fairly narrow thing. But as soon as you stray even a little bit outwards from that, the calibration, the accuracy of people starts to fall off dramatically, whatever the domain is. So it's really about being an expert or, or thinking that you are an expert. <laughs> like that's kind of where that comes in a bit. Yeah, I guess that there's kind of a trap where because you, th you think you know more than you actually do. And that leads you to being way overconfident on a bunch of things that are related to your actual core domain of expertise, uh, but we are, which are actually not, you're, you're not that good in, in, in those topics. So I'm, I'm curious if you have some starting points for people that want to get better at 
identifying these leprechauns and hunting them down. Okay, so starting points in what sense? Uh, sorry, you just need a bit of clarification. What, what kind of skills do you need? What, what sort of things do you need to? I mean, are oh. there are there research skills that you that you employ to to hunt this stuff down, or or how do you get better at this? Well, the, the way I used to express it was uh, uh, three things: uh, skepticism, curiosity, and tenacity. So, skepticism kind of goes without saying. Uh, it's it's the skill of uh, whenever you come across uh, a claim of, you know, taking a step back and and thinking first, do I actually understand what this this claim is about? Like, are we talking about uh, average developers versus best developers? Do I even notice that half of the people are saying one thing and and the other half are saying the other? Is the claim actually true? Is the where, where is the evidence? And assuming that it was true, what's the deal? What, what does that mean for me? What are the consequences? So that that's kind of the three subtopics in being skeptical. But you have to be skeptical in a, a constructive tetlock cause that actively open-minded. And for short, I would say, uh, be curious. Be actually open to investigating and learning new new things. Obviously, uh, that there's a great tool, uh, which is uh, Google or your uh, favorite search engine, or whatever that is, and, and some more uh, specialized search tools like whatever your library index, Google Books, uh, Google Scholar. Uh, I'm, I'm trying not to sound like, a, like, like an ad for Google here, but they really have a great deal of tools which make searching for information very, uh, very easy. Everyone can actually do that. Uh, so curiosity is essential, uh, and you have to want to get to the end of things. Uh, so that's one of the things, one of the things I found was really difficult when I was writing one chapter of, or another of Leprechauns that sometimes my search would seem to terminate in a paywall or just an article that I couldn't find anywhere in the web. And I could have given up there and say, that's it. I'm not, I'm not going to learn more about that. And then the idea is to try to just go a little bit beyond that. So if you have, say, the email of, of the author, then you try to contact the author. Uh, if you know someone who might know someone in the, in the university where the author works, uh, you can ask them to get a copy uh, of the article for you. And that's an actual example of something that happened to me this, well, between this summer and, and a week ago. Uh, in, in the summer, I did a workshop and we were dissecting this, uh, horrible, uh, study by, uh, NIST, the, uh, National Institute on, on, uh, uh, science and technology on, on the cost of bugs. And we were going through all the, the references and the citations and, and trying to find the primary sources. And there was this one thing about uh, another universal claim about uh, how effort is allocated in software projects, like 10% on requirements uh, or 20% on requirements and so many percent on, on actual coding and so many percent on testing. And we couldn't find the actual primary source was not findable anywhere on the web. The, the workshop was happening in Sweden and uh, the authors worked at uh, another university in Sweden. And so we, we set the group homework to those who were from Sweden to, to try and find the original paper. And I had kind of given up hope, but then a week ago, uh, someone emailed me the, the PDF uh, scan of the, the original study and said, I found it. I was great. I was really proud of actually having managed to to teach someone else besides me not to give up on on that kind of search and go look for primary source. I, I think that that's a great point, and I think it's really easy to get the idea that everything there is to know about computer science and about programming is available on the web. I certainly you know felt that impression in the past, but as I've spend as I spend more time doing research. I've discovered that there is a tremendous amount of work that was done in our field, just, you know, just even as recently as the 80s and 90s, that is not indexed on the web. It's not readily available. Um, there's work that's in books that are out of print, have never been scanned. There are papers that, you know, if you're lucky, they're behind a paywall at the ACM. If you're unlucky, um, mm. they're behind a 404. And if you're really unlucky, they just never were scanned in. It's surprising how much work, even in our field, has not been indexed, is not readily available on the web. There's another question of all this tenacity. I mean, 
you do this and you publish it. You have a book that comes out of all this research for you. And clearly you get a lot of satisfaction out of creating a narrative that is how this meme got started. What about people uh, who are just regular software developers and when we hit something that we think that we're able to identify as this, an assumption that we have or that our team has or that our manager has, how do we decide how much effort to put into the particular possible leprechauns that we find? Is there a way to come up with the value of that information? So for, for one thing, I, I think of myself as you know just a regular software developer. Awesome. I'm, not an, I'm not an academic. And I think that shows in, in, the, you know, in the tone of the book. I don't, I don't write like an academic. I don't try to write like an academic. I just try to write as I would talk to someone sitting across the table from me uh, and saying, yeah, there's this interesting thing that I've found. And I think of it as, uh, you know, I mentioned bugs in the brain. And to me, that's kind of a, I approach it the same way I would approach uh, finding a tricky bug in, in a program that I wrote or a program that I was in charge of that, you know, that someone on my team calls me in and say, Hey, what do you think of this odd behavior? And I admit that sometimes maybe I, w I, w I will go, you know, way beyond the call of duty, way beyond what would be considered reasonable in, in finding, I'm talking about software here in finding a bug. I want to understand, uh, I want to get to the bottom of things and figure out what could be causing it to behave in that strange way? Uh, you know, and, and some people might say, well, it's just a, you know, it's a cosmetic thing. It's a, a half the, the font height offset in, in something that appears on screen, but it nags at me. So I try to go to, to the very bottom of things. And most of the time I will learn something, maybe more than one thing. I will learn a lot about the API behind that little thing that's displayed on the screen. And we'll learn a lot about the architecture of the program. So there is a lot of uh, uh, serendipitous learning that happens as a result of investigating stuff, which for me tends to pay off. And sometimes you just make a note of, of it and say, well, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, and, and you do a risk assessment and you say, no user of the software is ever going to suffer from that. And it, it doesn't appear in a, in a place where it puts our image as, uh, you know, software crafts people at risk. So sometimes you just let it go. Uh, what, what I'm saying, I guess, is it's, uh, it's very personal. Uh, but if you show me someone who's always unconcerned, just say, oh, yeah, that's a bug. Okay. And moves on to the next thing. I'm not sure I would want to work with that person as a, you know, as a software developer. I agree. So and, does that answer the question? Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> I, yes. What I took away from that was if you dig, if you investigate, if you really figure out why something is happening, then you're going to learn all kinds of things that you didn't expect to learn. You won't just answer that question. You'll be developing yourself and your whole body of knowledge. And there's all kinds of, like you said, serendipity that comes out of that. Yep. And that segues into what I wanted to ask you about. A long time ago, I picked an interview with you for pics that was posted online. And my favorite thing out of that was how you talked about most of our job is learning. Yes. I guess that's the reason I, um, I get, you know, worked up uh, about those things is I, I see uh, the, the craft of software development uh, not so much as a as a, a process of churning out lines of code that happens in the process of figuring out what our users need, what makes them tick, what motivations they have, uh, but it's kind of incidental. Those things, uh, figuring out know, figuring out the reality of the world that we are trying to make an impact on. That's the real thing. I think it's beautiful that you express software development as it's really a process of figuring out the world. It's a process of digging into what seems simple on the surface and finding every nook and cranny that we need to account for in all the situations that our software might need to deal with. That's very nicely put as well. Once you do that, encoding it into whatever programming language is the easy part. Well, maybe easy is too strong a word. There, yeah. there's a whole lot. There, there is learning about the world, and there's also a lot of uh, learning about ourselves. 
And so one of the things that we struggle with uh, when we program, which is when, when we try to get these uh, insights about the world out of our heads and into something which has a behavior, uh, we run into all sorts of limitations of our human brains. Uh, and again, the, the human brain is kind of a clutch. It, it wouldn't pass an architectural review, basically or code review for that matter. So in the process of figuring out what goes well and what goes wrong when we capture uh, insight about the world, uh, we also learn a lot of useful stuff about ourselves. So there, there's always those two levels, at least, of learning going on. That's beautiful. And I'm reading right now in Avdi's favorite book about software development and reality construction, about how the artifacts we create are a means of learning that diagrams are when we draw them, we're interacting with them. It's part of our learning process, much more than about transferring that knowledge to others. And maybe the code is the same way as we code it. We're learning about the coding is part of the learning about the world. It's an external memory that our brain very, uses. Very much so. And it's also, I think that those things we're talking about is, explain why it literally uh, drives me up the wall. Well, not literally. <laughs> <laughs> it figuratively drives me up the wall when I see people acting as if, for instance, that, you know, modeling and diagramming uh, and, and cranking out software at the end of that process of documenting and diagramming and modeling was just a mechanical you know, linear thing, entirely predictable. And to me, that's like, no, that, that is just wrong. But, uh, and, and for some reason, those leprechauns, those, uh, kind of silly, if you take the time to think about them, uh, factoids about uh, 56% of the bugs in the project arise in the requirements phase. They really seem to comfort precisely those people who, we rely on, on that illusion that the whole thing is a mechanical, just, you know, just turn the crank uh, and, and software will come out the other end. That it's black and white. Right. That we can find truths beyond local truths for various degrees of local. Mm -hmm. I wanted to bring one thing back from the very beginning of this episode. The quote came up about the definition of insanity is... Uh, doing the same thing over and over again and, and expecting different results. You said that's a misquote or yeah, is it I just think wrong? It's, it's well, so the story behind it is, so I'm sorry because I've, I, I, I kind of become this, uh, encyclopedia of use, useless facts, <laughs> you know, after a while. So I, I like the sentiment of the quote and you can, uh, there are contexts where the code has meaning and you can use it to, to convince people that maybe they use, they should look at things in a different way. Uh, and again, as I said in the beginning, to me, uh, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, that's, that's the, the definition of experimentation. So, yeah, so it's also wrong. But the, the, the true story seems to be that the, this quote was in uh, uh, an Alcoholic Anonymous uh, document from the, the brochure from the 80s, and it was it was not attributed in that document. And then a few years later, it spread into it's it's, it, it, it's a pre-internet meme, and it was attributed to uh, Einstein as one of the it, it's one of the features that the meme gained uh, as it morphed and spread uh, that made it more palatable, more acceptable. It's it's kind of lovely to even know that this story exists. So to even know that there there is this way that uh, ideas arise. Basically, uh, I, I don't know who came up with that phrase, but very probably not Einstein. Uh, and then the fact of attributing it to Einstein made made it more popular, and and uh, and it became the viral misquote that we know today. But one of the reasons it got so popular was because, as you point out, in a lot of situations, it's useful. True. And and the, the myth of the 10x developer is useful to certain people who don't want to train their devs. They just want to hire magic. True. Yeah. So you kind of have to ask for all of those factoids, who is this useful to? <laughs> 
Right. Well, that's a that's a great question to ask in the course of investigating. One of those is maybe more a cynical way of putting it would be uh, whose agent that does it serve? And All when, the money. When you, yeah, exactly. When you ask that question, you're already halfway to the truth. Hmm. But there, I mean, there are less there are less uh, you know selfish interests at work too. I mean, sometimes like so. One of the things that this discussion has reminded me of uh, is one of my recent discoveries of a sort of like. A uh, cytogenesis factoid that I, I ran into, which is that, uh, you know, uh, in programming, uh, one of the popular things for hackers to do is to play around with weird keyboards and weird keyboard layouts. Mm. And I, I was always, you know, for years and years, I was exposed to the meme that Dvorak is more efficient than QWERTY. And that QWERTY was deliberately, you know, made to be inefficient, you know, to, to keep the typewriter heads from jamming. Um, Wait, and I think what that's not true. Well, no. I think there's I think there's less truth. So this is something to go investigate. It's been a little while since I investigated it. I'm not sure about the part about the the QWERTY part. Um, I understand that there were a number of competing keyboards around the time that QWERTY came about, and its ascension was kind of. It really sounds like it was kind of one of those things where. You, you know, one one company markets a little better, and 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 it becomes the standard historical um, accident. Yeah, exactly. But what was really interesting to me is that all of the Dvorak papers out there, and all like almost all the the documentation on Dvorak being better, traced back, you know, back and back through site after site after site to one really small, really flawed study, like in the the fifties uh, or sixties. I can't remember when Dvorak was was first created. That was created, you know, by Dvorak. You know, and mm. basically like commissioned to sell keyboards or something along those lines, you know, but it just a really flawed study, very small sample size and various other things wrong with it. And like very little research had been done apart from that. But, you know, the interesting thing to me about that is, is that it may be that it's not more efficient or it's not much more efficient the way it's claimed. But it may also be that people that, that learn to type Dvorak are more comfortable. And that's a little bit harder to measure. I've talked about on the show before. I have this. I acquired this Kinesis keyboard, which um, I love, and and is literally. I never realized that typing could be that comfortable before. I have no idea if I am more efficient on it or not, and I don't care um, because for me, it's it's about the comfort of it. And you know, sometimes I think we we glom onto these things. We want empirical basis for the things that honestly just make us comfortable. Mm. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> confirmation bias again I've probably uh, done the same thing uh, th there are lots of uh, uh, domains where uh, which are completely rife with that sort of thing like nutrition exercise, sleep uh, <coughs> agile <laughs> well there you go <laughs> that too uh, and, and probably part of the uh, one way to get less worked up about that, that sort of thing is to say there is, there is room in here for a lot of, uh, a wide range of variations. So why not, uh, allow that people can choose to do whatever their thing is and just, you know, be content that not everybody's, uh, marching to the same drummer. So again, there's this theme of, uh, universal versus universal truth and, and doctrine and prescription, uh, versus local custom. I'm not even talking about local truth here. Just mm. this is the way we roll and it's fine with us and you can choose to work here or not, basically. And that's, I guess, to some people, uh, that's threatening uh, because it works if we are open to the, the possibility of, of leaving a lot up to autonomy, to, to people uh, making their own choices as adults. And I guess some people find that notion a bit unsettling. Does that relate back to the state startups within the government? <laughs> well, there's quite a bit of that going on, yes. But I guess it's not limited to government. Uh, any organization that's grown big enough to have uh, a, I don't know what, what they're called in, in English, those, uh, you know, uh, program management offices. Mm. And there, there, there always seems to be, uh, it, it ends up to be someone's job to make sure that Everyone uses the same ALM tool, blah, blah, blah. Enterprise that sort of, architecture. Yeah, that sort of stuff. Or my, what, no, I, 
I, I can't even begin to imagine the, the horrors that would befall us if, if everybody were, uh, you know, left to their own devices in their choice of an IDE. Someone must step in and make sure that everyone does the right thing. So the only thing that saves us here is it takes about three years to, to do the survey of all IDE tools on the market and decide on which, what the best one is, by which time, obviously, the, the survey has become obsolete and it's, they, they can do it over again. Well, I'm, I'm sketching a caricature here, but I don't think it's very far from the truth. So one alternative is to just try and treat people and, and teams as uh, adults, give them free reign, trust them to do the right thing, uh, give them a small budget so that failure is not, is not a big deal. And that's another thing which comes with the terrain of experimentation. If you, if you, if you actually do experiments, uh, a lot of the time you're going to fail. This is something that scientists know or, or, or they should know that most of the times your experiment just doesn't pan out. And that's okay. You say the next one and you move on to that. So, but you, to do that, you have to, to say, no, you're not allowed to spend a uh, hundred million euros in public money to build the behemoth of a project and lord it over uh, hordes of programming minions, right? You have our uh, blessing to do your thing on a small scope with a small team, with a small budget. And if it works, we will amplify it. That's what the state startup, that's what the deal is with the, the so-called state startups. But I think France is not, not really leading the charge on that. We're imitating, I guess you might say, stuff that's already going on in the UK, uh, in the States. So I'm taking that as a good sign that even government is waking up to the fact that short cycles, experimentation and treating people as adults is actually a thing. Yeah, both at an individual and institutional level, we need that constant learning. Yes, exactly. Awesome. Avdi, do you have anything else? No, I think that pretty much covers it for me. Laurent, was there anything else you wanted to say, or shall we get to picks? Oh, let's get to picks. Okay. Can't. Before we get to picks, I want to take some time to thank our silver sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Code School. Code School is an online learning destination for existing and aspiring developers that teach us through entertaining content. They provide immersive video lessons with in-browser challenges, which means that each course has a unique theme and storyline and feels much more like a game. Whether you've been programming for a long time or have only just begun, Code School has something for everyone. You can master Ruby on Rails or JavaScript, as well as Git, HTML, CSS, and iOS. More than a million people around the world use CodeSchool to improve their development skills by learning or doing. You can find more information at CodeSchool.com slash Ruby Rogues. Avdi, what are your picks? Uh, well, first of all, I, I think I'm just going to pick uh, the book in question, Leprechauns of Software Development. Um, oh, that's very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the way this episode happened was uh, a while back we had uh, episode 183. No, not 183. Uh, 184. The, the one about what we actually know about software development with uh, Greg Wilson and, and Andreas Stefik. And in the way, after we released that episode, somebody reminded me of the exes- existence of the Leprechaun, Leprechaun's book. It had been on my to read list for a long time and it kind of slipped my mind. And so I went and I said, okay, I'm just going to sit down and read this. And it's, it's a relatively short read. It's a very easy read. It's a very, very um, pleasant read. Um, you have a, a great writing style. And, um, it just blew me away. I was, I was kind of floored that some of the things that I'd always, you know, taken on authority really had very little basis. So I kind of insisted that everybody, that all the other rogues go and read this. And, and that's how this happened. And so, yeah, I, I really recommend this book. I think every, every software developer should read it. Yeah. He went a little farther than all of you should read this. He said, I will buy it for you if you will read it. <laughs> yes. So yeah, go get it. It's great. And uh, apart from that, oh, you know, I, I do have another technical pick. Um, I will pick the Crystal programming language. I've been fiddling with that lately. I've been noticing a, a, an uptick in interest. It is an, an alpha level language and how to characterize it. It's the sort of, it's a statically typed compiled programming language that is a, around the same level of abstraction as Go. Um, I think you would probably, or when it's, when it's, when it's mature, you'll probably use it for the same sort of things that you would use Go for. Um, whether it's like distributing uh, executables out to people or network uh, middlewares and you know things that need to run fast or things that need to interface closely with C code because it does that really well. But 
it has it is almost interface compatible with Ruby. It is type inferencing, so most of the time it figures out the types, and you don't really have to tell it give it much extra information than would already be be in a Ruby program. And uh, so it basically gives you all the static uh, compile time checks of a compiled static programming language with nearly compatible syntax to Ruby. I mean, you can take Ruby code and sort of uh, munge it a little bit and, and you'll have a valid crystal program. So I'm, I'm really pretty excited about this. It's like I said, it's still, still alpha, still under heavy development, still its APIs are still being worked out. Um, libraries are being filled in, but, uh, it seems like a, an interesting candidate for things like, um, you know, that one service that we would write in Go, except let's write it in something that's practically Ruby or, it might even be an interesting way at some point of doing C ex- extensions, except not in C. Now we do them in Crystal. So, yeah, check it out. Now, um, as far as non-code picks, uh, I'm just going to pick the uh, Zoji Rushi line of appliances. Uh, as, as most listeners know, I, I've, we've got a big family, and, and so we, we started kind of... <laughs> We, we've realized that we need to kind of go industrial strength with some of our cooking, so we got a, a Zoji Rushi uh, rice machine, uh, which is great for those big batches of rices for big, cheap meals. And uh, that thing worked so darn well that um, when we went looking for a, a bread machine so that we could just have bread baking basically every day, uh, we went ahead and got the Zoji Rushi model. And uh, we've been really impressed with their performance. So uh, I think that about wraps it up for my picks. Okay, great. Laurent? Well, Avdi, I will, I will see your crystal and uh, raise you an Elm. Uh, so that's Elm, the programming language. Yes. Uh, I don't even remember how I came across it, but I've been having fun learning uh, in in Elm for uh, a bit over six months yet, and uh, I'm very happy with it. So it also has that same kind of type inferencing that seems to be designed to, to you know put an end to the uh, the holy wars between the the uh, static typing and dy- dynamic typing uh, folks. So that's my my peak as far as programming languages. I'd love to go to an Elm conference. Moving on to something completely different, a site called uh, Smarter Every Day, uh, where the, the, the must-watch thing is called the, the Backwards Brain Bicycle. Uh, if, if you haven't seen that video, rush and, and see it now. It's uh, uh, kind of along the lines of what I was saying earlier about the experiment that gets people to feel what it's like to have a cognitive bias, uh, except with the bike. So uh, I'm not going to spoil it any further. And uh, just, you know, just for the heck of it, I wanted to uh, have as uh, one of my picks. I'm allowed whatever I want, right? Right, right, right. And uh, so I picked one of my favorite science fiction books that I've read lately, which is called called Station Eleven by uh, Emily St. John John Mandel, I think her her name is. And it's a lovely little gem of a book. Awesome. Thanks. Can't wait to read it and watch the bike video. Okay. For my picks, I have to pick How to Measure Everything, which was totally on the list of things to pick today already. And it's uh, a great book. It's technically about business, but specifically the business of IT. Yeah, just pick it up, look at it. It uh, teaches you about calibration. It teaches you about how to give estimates and intervals and how to give like accurate estimates and intervals and also how to measure the value of information. So you know how much work to put into learning the things that you don't know and uh, verifying your assumptions. Super useful. And it's on audible. That'll do for picks for me. Uh, Laurence, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Saran had to drop off, but she says thank you again. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. So it was, it was great to, to finally get to talk to you. Yeah. Great yeah, it was, uh, I had a great time. I hope yeah, the, the, the whole thing will not come across as too uh, rambly and disjointed. And, That's I don't know, what it's... podcasts are for. <laughs> yeah, cool. Cool. Okay, so see everybody next week. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Would you like to join a conversation with the Rogues and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at rubyrogues.com slash parlor.